Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Zulfakar and the reason I launched this channel is to share with the world my own collection of antique shawls and other antiques from Kashmir, a place where I was born and raised and a place that forms a very big part of my own identity. Let's start this first episode with my shawl collection. Now, when I say Kashmir shawls, I'm not talking about the so-called Pashmina shawls that you find online or in stores across India and other parts of the world, with some selling for as low as $20. So let me start by providing you some background and context to help you appreciate what you are about to see. The first and perhaps the most important thing is the fiber that these shawls are made from. It is no ordinary wool, but the downy undercoat of the Kashmir goat that lives in the Changthang region of the Ladakh province of Kashmir. The common name for this fiber is Pashmina, but that is a Persian derivative of the name. The original Kashmiri name for this wool is Pam. They grow this downy undercoat in the winter in response to the extreme cold and the rarefied environment in which they live. It is very warm, but extremely light how light, you might ask? Well, the width of the fiber is only 13 to 19 microns. In comparison, the human hair is 70 microns in width. The fiber is just the start. Equally impressive is the unique weaving technique of the woven Kashmiri shawls in my collection. This technique which is found nowhere else in the world except Kashmir, is commonly referred to as Kani weaving. Kani being the Hindi version of the Kashmiri word Kani, which means twigs. Why that name? Well, that's because the weft threads of the shawl are wrapped around fine sharpened twigs, which in Kashmiri are called Kani, the plural of the word Kani. Now, to get an understanding of the complexity of this weaving technique, imagine having to paint a very complex design on a blank canvas, painting one or just a few pixels at a time. Now, to this add the fact that the shawls woven in the Kani technique were not small. On the contrary, they were very large, with some of the rectangular shawls reaching an incredible length of 11 feet and an approximate width of about 5 feet, and some of the square shawls eventually getting to about 6 square feet. Consider that even the genuine handwoven Kashmiri shawls for women today do not reach lengths beyond 80 inches and a width beyond 38 inches. I would be remiss if I also did not mention the extraordinary skill of the dyers who created these brilliant hues for the shawls, the nakash or the artist who created the patterns in the hundreds of thousands, the darners who at one stage in the history of the shawls put together multiple pieces that were woven on multiple looms to create a single shawl. They did it with such dexterity that it is hard, even with a magnifying glass, to detect a single seam or joint in the final product. Another thing that I want to point out is that unlike most ethnic textiles, the Kashmiri shawl was never worn by the locals. Until the early part of the 20th century, it was a luxury textile reserved only for the royalty and aristocracy, and later the wealthy landed classes of Europe and India. With that backdrop, let's take a look at the Kani or woven shawls in my collection.
The other type of Kashmiri shawl in my collection is the embroidered shawl. The difference between the Kani shawl and the embroidered shawl is that in case of the former, the pattern is woven as part of the fabric itself. Whereas with embroidered shawls, the plain fabric is first woven on a hand loom and then embroidered. Some scholars strongly believe that the embroidered shawl was introduced as a cheaper and quicker alternative to the more labor-intensive Kani shawl. I, however, believe that the embroidered shawl was a parallel craft to the Kani shawl and is no less a marvel. Perhaps you will agree after you see the embroidered shawls in my collection. My collection represents my lifelong passion to acquire, to study, and to preserve any object that reflects my cultural heritage. It is what I have dedicated my life to, even at the risk of my own financial future. 
my shawl collection reflects the development of this form from the 1700s to the present day. And it's not defined only by the finest or the rarest. I leave to those who have the means and the natural or acquired taste to indulge in that pursuit. The reason I launched this channel is to show the world a side of Kashmir that many people, including Kashmiris, are not familiar with. Mine is an alternate narrative to the drumbeat of war and the stories of violence, death and destruction that have come out of Kashmir during the last three decades. Stories that have overshadowed the identity of Kashmiris as inheritors of a rich artistic heritage. During my research, I discovered that the artists and craftsmen of Kashmir were for centuries subject to relentless oppression and were barely paid enough to survive on. And yet, they remained unwaveringly true to their craft and produced one masterpiece after another. Each finding a place in the royal wardrobes of kings, princes and nobles of India and prominently featured in their portraits as well as subtly making their appearance in key historical events. And at the turn of the 19th century, when the Kashmir shawl captured the fascination of Napoleon's first wife, Queen Josephine, the Kashmir shawl became the most sought after textile of European aristocracy. Portrait after portrait of that era boldly showcases the Kashmir shawl in all its elegant glory. But while their creations adorned the courts of both India and Europe, the Kashmiri shawl weavers lived a life of poverty and servitude and died in anonymity with their creations as the only reminder of their sad existence. In my opinion, this sentiment is best expressed by Mirza Ghalib, the greatest poet of the Urdu language, in this couplet. Sab kaha kuch lala o gulme namaya ho gain Sab kaha kuch lala o gulme namaya ho gain Khaak mein kya surte hongi ki penha ho gain It is but a rare few that emerge as a tulip and a rose Ah, the beauties that yet lie concealed in eternal repose. My collection is a humble tribute to these unsung heroes of Kashmir's artistic legacy. I realize that the story of Kashmir and its artistic heritage has been told before and by people far more capable and knowledgeable than I am. But the story has always been told by visitors. Some who stayed in the valley for a summer or so, others stayed a bit longer, but visitors nevertheless. This time, let's hear the story from a Kashmiri. And what a fascinating story it is. The story is set in a place that emperors and travelers alike have called paradise on earth and justifiably so.
कुछ फन का This was the world of my ancestors. It's not too hard to imagine that people living in such surroundings would be anything but creative. And the pinnacle of their creativity, the fabled Kashmir shawl. And what I find even more fascinating is that you can still see the unmistakable influence of the Kashmir shawls 200 years later in today's design aesthetic. And it's everywhere whether you open a fashion magazine, browse through the clothing racks of a departmental store, or even shop for dinnerware. Of course, most of you would call this motif Paisley, but I'm not sure how many of you know the history behind this name. Paisley is actually a town in Scotland which was one of the major production centers for cheap copies of the Kashmir shawls that were woven on newly invented machines during the Industrial Revolution. Somehow the name of this one town stuck and was associated with a motif that was created hundreds of years ago and thousands of miles away in the valley of Kashmir. My fond hope is that this story inspires the young men and women and future generations of Kashmiris to pick up the mantle of their ancestral heritage and Kashmir once again takes its rightful place in the world as a land of beauty, peace, harmony and artistic excellence.